Hello, everyone. This is um, basically a recording of the lecture that I gave on Wednesday, April 1st. Unfortunately, I forgot to hit the record button when I was given that lecture. So what that means is um, this is going to be a little different from the actual lecture session. It's going to cover the same material, but you're not going to have students asking questions and that sort of thing uh, because this is recorded basically separately. But I'm going to go over the same material. So let's go ahead and get started here. Okay, so uh, I just want to remind everyone that you have a lab quiz on the brain and cranial nerves, which is due Friday at midnight, and a pre-lab on muscles and movement that is due Friday at midnight as well. And when I say Friday at midnight, technically it's 11.59, uh, but Friday at midnight is a little easier to, uh, to remember. But it is Friday. It is not um, – it's Friday night. It is not – midnight Friday morning. A few students have been a little confused about that, and I just want to clarify. It is Friday at midnight. So um, the first thing I talked about briefly was the COVID-19 cases, because I know that's something that, that's weighing heavily on our mind. In Wisconsin, we're actually in pretty good shape. We are at, uh, at the time, we were at a little um, uh, above 1,300 cases or so. And what I had pointed out to students was that even though the cases are going up, they're going to continue to go up, but it looked like the curve was flattening a bit. So instead of, oh, where's, instead of a curve going up like that, which is what we don't want, it did seem like it was getting to flatten a little bit. because We're not out of the woods yet. And in fact, um, since I originally gave this presentation, we actually had an increase of plus 200. So we're still continuing to go up. Uh, but um, we, uh, I do believe the curve is beginning to flatten. They're, the experts are saying that we should peak in about a couple of weeks. And I estimate that's going to be around 3,000 people probably infected by that time, um, which while not something to to do jump uh, to do cartwheels over could be much much worse but continue to follow the recommendations of um, the Wisconsin Health Department and stay at home only go out if you absolutely have to like for food or medical attention something of that nature we're all in this together and the choices you make affect other people not just yourself So some students were having trouble finding um, where they were supposed to enter the answers on the lab quizzes. Uh, and so I have pointed out here that on the lab quizzes, there's a little box that's in the bottom left. That's where you enter your, uh, your answers. Uh, here on the left, when I captured this picture, I had clicked into that box. And so you can see it. On the right here is what it looks like before you click into it. So it's very faint. You can see it, but you have to sort of sort of find it. So it'll be in the bottom left. Once you click into it, then you'll be able to see it. Uh, so I apologize um, if some of you had trouble finding that, but that's where you'll that's where where you'll find it. Um, and if you did, you know, if you started the quiz and you weren't able to find that, just send me an email. I can re basically. Um, clear your attempt at that quiz and you can take it over again. Okay, so we're going to start where we left off on Monday. We covered the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Well, let me go back. First, we talked about the three different types of muscle tissue. Then we specifically talked about the functions of the muscular system. We covered the anatomy of a muscle, that is muscle, the organ, such as your biceps brachii, pectoralis major, etc. And we said that a muscle 
was basically skeletal muscle fibers packaged in various layers of connective tissue, similar to a nerve. Then we specifically focused on a skeletal muscle fiber or a cell. And we covered the anatomy of that cell, the myofibrils, the anatomy of a myofibril, the sarcomeres, which make up the basic units of a myofibril. We said the contraction occurs in a sarcomere, and that's what you're looking at here. And here, a sarcomere is composed of your thick filaments of myosin, your thin filaments of actin. Where you have overlap between the thick and thin filaments, you have these projections called myosin heads. And when a sarcomere contracts, the myosin heads bind to the actin filament, then they do the power stroke, pulling them inward, and then they detach. And they do that all along, both sides, all along the overlap. And that process of binding, power stroke, detach, binding, power stroke, detach, pulls the Z lines toward the center causing that sarcomere to contract. And as all the sarcomeres contract, the myofibrils contract. And the myofibrils, which fill the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle fibers, as they contract, the skeletal muscle fiber contracts. And in this illustration, we, we showed here a sarcomere that was not contracted. You can see there's a in the bear zone here or eight zone. And then here we have one that has contracted. And you can see that bear zone is gone and there's complete overlap between the actin and myosin filaments. And this was this is the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. So that's how sarcomeres contract, causing myofibrils contract, causing skeletal muscle fibers to contract. So that explains how contraction occurs. What it does not explain is why contraction occurs. Like, so what causes the myosin heads to bind the actin filaments? And that's what our next topic is going to cover. So your learning objectives are as follows. Describe a motor unit. Explain how motor units differ in muscles with fine motor control versus muscles in coarse motor control. Describe in detail a neuromuscular junction. Describe in detail how an action potential produced in a motor neuron causes contraction in a skeletal muscle fiber. And lastly, describe how a skeletal muscle fiber relaxes. Okay, so what causes a muscle to contract? Well, it's stimulated by a nerve. When a, when a nerve stimulates a skeletal muscle fiber to contract, that's when it contracts. Muscle fibers have two properties. One property is excitability, the ability to detect and respond to a stimulus. We talked about how early on, how every cell in the body has the ability to detect and respond to a stimulus. But what's unique about skeletal muscle fibers is they also have contractability. They have the ability to forcibly shorten when an adequate stimulus is received. Okay, and I'm gonna, oops, sorry, I'm gonna play this video here which is going to illustrate that process. At the start of contraction. Bear with me just a second while I share that. Okay, cool. I was a little confused here for a second, sorry. Stored calcium ions are released into the cytoplasm. Calcium ions expose binding sites on the actin molecules, 
Globular heads on the myosin can bind to these sites, forming cross bridges. Repeated binding and release moves the filaments relative to one another, and as this occurs simultaneously in many sarcomeres, the entire muscle shortens or contracts. This process requires energy in the form of ATP. Okay, that is actually not the video I had meant to show you. So that actually is a video that is coming up when we talk about ATP. So that is an important video, but it is not the one that I had meant to show you. So please stand by as I pull up the actual correct video. Thank you for your patience. I'll have it in just a second. I hope. Yes, I have it now. Activate skeletal muscle, the central nervous system initiates an action potential that travels down the spinal cord to the motor neurons. As the nerve fiber branches, the action potential travels down each branch. Each nerve fiber branches many times and stimulates several skeletal muscle fibers. The union of the axon and muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. Zooming into the microscopic level, each branch of the neuron has a terminal that invaginates the muscle fiber while remaining outside the muscle fiber plasma membrane. The action potential arrives at the axon terminal. In the terminal, the action potential causes the release of acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicles into space between the axon terminal and the muscle fiber, called the synaptic cleft. In the synaptic cleft, the acetylcholine binds with the receptor site on the fiber membrane, which opens a chemically gated ion channel. Sodium then rushes through the ion channel into the muscle fiber, causing an action potential to form on the fiber membrane. The action potential spreads along the muscle fiber. As more nerve branches activate additional fibers, the action potential spreads over the entire muscle. Upon activation, the muscle contracts. Okay, so basically what, basically what this video was demonstrating is that muscle fibers only contract when they're stimulated by a motor neuron to contract. This figure shows motor units. Basically, motor units are how the motor neurons and the skeletal muscle fibers are organized. So, motor neurons in the spinal cord or brain, the central nervous system, control and activate skeletal muscle fibers. A motor unit is one motor neuron and all the muscle cells that they stimulate. In this figure from your book, two motor units are shown here. One number, uh, motor unit number one is color coded in red. You can see here's our motor neuron, and here's the one, two skeletal muscle fibers that it controls. Motor unit number two is color coded in, I guess this is purple, and it controls three, has synapses with three skeletal muscle fibers. Notice that while a motor neuron can activate several skeletal muscle fibers, each skeletal muscle fiber is only controlled by one 
motor neuron. These skeletal muscle fibers are only going to contract when they are stimulated by a motor neuron. Otherwise, they don't contract. So let's look at well, how does a motor neuron stimulate contraction. So in other words, what does a motor neuron have to do with the myosin heads binding to the actin filaments? So what we're looking at here, what we're looking at here is a neuromuscular junction. That's basically where we have a synapse between the motor neuron and the skeletal muscle fibers. So this is this is the axon of the motor neuron. Here are the axon terminals from that motor neuron. And this is a skeletal muscle fiber. Notice that we actually have several locations on the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, where they synapse. When a neuro, excuse me, when a motor neuron generates an action potential, that action potential comes down the axon into each of the axon terminals. And let's look closer at what's happening there. So this is a blow up of that synapse. We have the same situation here as we had with the synapse between two neurons. The only difference is we have a motor neuron that's the sending neuron. And instead of having a receiving neuron, we have a skeletal muscle fiber. But everything else is the same. We have a space between the axon terminal of the motor neuron and the skeletal muscle fiber, the sarcolemma of the skeletal muscle fiber. That space is called the synaptic cleft, if you recall. And when that axon, excuse me, that action potential enters the axon terminal, it's going to cause these vesicles, which contain a neurotransmitter, to merge with the plasma membrane and dump its contents by exocytosis into the synaptic cleft. Now, in the past, we talked generically about this neurotransmitter. In the somatic nervous system, it's always acetylcholine. So this neurotransmitter is specifically acetylcholine. So we have an axon, we have an action potential coming down into the axon terminal, and it's causing these vesicles containing acetylcholine to merge with the plasma membrane of the axon terminal and dump its contents of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Let's look at this more closely. So here we have that vesicle merging with the plasma membrane of the axon terminal, dumping its acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. It's then going to uh, diffuse through the synaptic cleft and bind receptors on the skeletal muscle fiber. Those receptors are attached to sodium and potassium channels. And that causes sodium channels to open. We get sodium rushing in, causing depolarization. And if it's high enough, that causes an action potential. And that action potential is going to spread along the entire length of the skeletal muscle fiber. So that motor neuron releases neurotransmitter, which causes sodium channels to open in the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber, which causes an action potential. So what does an action potential have to do with those myosin heads binding to the actin receptors, right? What's going to cause the action potential to, um, to stimulate contraction? Well, something that I didn't mention when we were talking about the sliding filament theory, and that is that when a sarcomere is not contracted, when the myosin heads are not bound to the actin filament, that is because there are protein complexes that basically block the myosin heads from binding the actin filaments.
obviously skeletal muscle fibers are not contracted all the time. They're not being stimulated by the motor neuron all the time. So how does the muscle fiber relax? Well, it relaxes because there's no myosin binding the actin filament because there's a protein complex blocking the binding site. When an action potential moves through a skeletal muscle fiber, it causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. That calcium binds to that protein that's blocking the myosin binding site and moves it out of the way. That allows the myosin heads to bind and do the power stroke. So in other words, the reason why the myosin heads bind to the actin filaments and cause contraction is because calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in response to an action potential. That action potential is caused by the uh, acetylcholine being released by the, neuro by the motor neuron causing the action potential. With that calcium moving those protein complexes out of the way, the myosin heads bind and do the power stroke. Now, after the myosin heads bind and do the power stroke, they're now attached to the actin filaments. How are they released? Well, that's where ATP comes in. ATP comes in and releases them. So to show this in its entirety, when calcium is available, the myosin head binds to the actin filament. It then does the power stroke. ATP then comes in and releases it from the actin filament that allows it to reposition and as long as there's still calcium, it binds again. So I want you to think of this process as like an oar that you use to row a boat, going into the water, doing the stroke, and then coming out again. So here the oar goes into the water. That's when the myosin head binds the actin filament and then you stroke. If there's ATP, you're able to raise the ore back out of the water and reposition it. And as long as there's calcium, that ore can go back down in the water and do the power stroke again. So contraction requires calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and ATP to detach from that actin filament and reposition for another round attachment and and um, uh, and stroke. Okay, I'm going to show you that video that I showed a few minutes ago. Which will illustrate. I hope. At the start of contraction, stored calcium ions are released into the cytoplasm. Calcium ions expose binding sites on the actin molecules. Globular heads on the myosin can bind to these sites, forming cross bridges. Repeated binding and release moves the filaments relative to one another, and as this occurs simultaneously in many sarcomeres, the entire muscle shortens or contracts. This process requires energy in the form of ATP. Okay. So, again, calcium is required for the myosin head to bind, do the power stroke. But it's stuck there until ATP comes in and releases it. Then it can reposition, if the, and if there's still calcium present, it can bind again. So, again, calcium and ATP are required for a muscle contraction. Calcium for binding, power stroke, ATP for detaching and repositioning. Now, to illustrate the importance of ATP, in what situation 
does a sale not have any ATP at all. In fact, the body itself has no ATP at all. Well, that would be a situation where one dies. When one dies, obviously there's no more oxygen entering the body, and so there's no uh, the cells have no ability to make ATP. So there's no ATP. Well, what happens to the muscles of the body after death? They get stiff, as people say. Basically, what they do is they contract and they stay contracted. That's called rigor mortis, sometimes just referred to as rigor. Well, what's happening is after death, the sarcoplasmic reticulum begins to deteriorate and releases its calcium. So the myosin heads bind. Because there's no ATP, they're stuck there. So the muscles are locked in a contracted position, and that's why the bodies stiffen up. Now, eventually, as deterioration continues, the, my, uh, the sarcomeres, the myofibrils, they all start to deteriorate, right? And so then you do get detachment and breakdown and, you, and, and rigor mortis goes away. How quickly that occurs really de depends on the temperature, humidity, other, other factors. And uh, that is how or is one of the ways that a medical examiner can actually estimate time of death. Right, they look at at what stage is their rigor or rigor mortis, and what are the environmental conditions in which the body has been kept. Okay, so I want to summarize muscle contraction uh, as stimulated by a motor neuron. So we're going to start at the motor neuron, work our way down to skeletal muscle fiber. Nerve impulses move down an axon into the axon terminal at the neuromuscular junction. That causes acetylcholine to be released into the synaptic cleft. That acetylcholine then binds to receptors on the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. That causes sodium channels to open, sodium to flow, and an action potential to move across the skeletal muscle fiber. Why do we care about an action potential? Well, that causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. That calcium then binds to the actin filaments, making them available to the, making the binding sites for myosin available. Myosin heads then bind the actin filaments, and <clears throat> right. So then you have the power stroke, and, and then ATP allows the cross bridges or bindings to to uh, detach and reposition for reattachment. Okay, and it's typically at this point where I would ask students for questions about this process. So this summary of muscle contraction is very important. It basically, you should be able to sit down and explain how a motor neuron stimulates a skeletal muscle fiber to contract. And that is what this summary here basically does. You should be able to do that. If you can do that, then you understand how a motor neuron stimulates muscle fiber contraction. If you can't, then you don't truly understand that. So I emailed out to everyone this little learning activity, and I asked them after the lecture to please complete it. Basically, it's a flow chart for illustrating how an action potential produced by a motor neuron causes a skeletal muscle fiber to contract. So here we have our motor neuron. Here we have an action potential moving down the axon. And then here at the end, of the process, we have a skeletal muscle fiber contracted. Your job is to fill in what happens between all of this, okay? And make it as brief as possible. Don't go into great details. Think about the process that you would use to tell someone how to get to your house. To assume we don't have GPS. At one time, we didn't, right? As you describe to someone how to get to your house, you do an outline. There are specific landmarks that you will call to their attention, specific roads that you will call to their attention. You will not include every building, every house, everything of interest that they will pass because it's not necessary to understand how to get to your house. In a similar manner, describe how a motor neuron generates an action potential and how that leads to muscle fiber contraction. Really a good way to, to do this is to start with the end and work your way back. And I'm gonna do this verbally 
and then I want you to sit down and do it for yourself, but write it out. So why does the skeletal muscle fiber contract? Well, it contracts because when the myosin heads bind the actin filaments and do the power stroke. Well, when do they do that? Well, they do that when there is calcium available in the cytoplasm. Well, when does that happen? Well, when the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, why does that occur? Well, it occurs in response to an action potential in the skeletal muscle fiber. Well, what causes an action potential in the skeletal muscle fiber? Well, acetylcholine released by a motor neuron binds to receptors, causes sodium channels to open. Well, where does acetylcholine come from? It comes from the motor neuron in response to an action potential moving down the axon of that motor neuron. Okay, so that's a great process to go through to teach yourself how a motor neuron stimulates a skeletal muscle fiber to contract. So this is a great learning activity to help you learn this concept. Okay, up to this point, we have focused on the skeletal muscle fiber. We're now going to move to skeletal muscle, the organ. Like your biceps brachii, like your pectoralis major. We're going to describe twitch, unfused tetany, and fused tetany. We're going to describe their effects on the tension produced by skeletal muscle fiber. And then we'll move on to, uh, I didn't get to this, so um, in the next session on Friday, we'll talk about isometric and isotonic contractions uh, and. Um, we will talk now about motor units producing smooth contraction of skeletal muscles and how motor units maintain muscle tone. Okay, so when we talk about skeletal uh, muscle fiber contraction, it's an all or nothing thing. Either a skeletal muscle fiber contracts or it doesn't. There's no it contracting a, a skeletal muscle fiber or cell contracting a little bit or a lot. Either it contracts completely or not at all. When we talk about skeletal muscles, the organ, like biceps brachii, of course, there are different amounts of contraction, or what we call a graded contraction. Certainly, if you're going to pick up a 10-pound weight with your right arm, there's going to be much more contraction of the muscles of your arm to pick up that 10-pound weight than if you picked up a piece of paper. So when we talk skeletal muscles, the organ, there are, contraction is graded. It's graded because not all fibers have to be stimulated at the same time. You can have different combinations of muscle fibers in a muscle contracting at different times. And that leads to different degrees of skeletal muscle shortening. So let's say 50 pounds is the maximum amount of weight that I can lift with my arm. Well, you better believe every skeletal muscle fiber and every muscle that's involved in that movement is going to be contracting at the same time. If I were to just pick up a flower, probably a small percentage of the skeletal muscle fibers in the muscles of my arm involved in that process, right, are going to be contracted. So you get different amounts of contraction, different amounts of tension produced in skeletal muscle fiber as a result of different numbers of skeletal muscle fibers contracting it at a given time. Skeletal muscles, so skeletal muscles have greater responses and leading to differences in shortening. The force generated by skeletal muscle depends on the number of fibers stimulated. So in other words, the more fibers that are being stimulated by motor neurons at one time, the greater the force. The greater the force, the greater amount of tension that's generated. Now, let's look at how skeletal muscles respond to stimulation, because believe it or not, how often a skeletal muscle fiber is stimulated determines uh, the amount of tension that's generated. Okay. Now, for the next few slides, I'm going to be showing you graphs that will show you the amount of tension that is produced by a muscle over time in response to stimulation in a lab 
by electricity. In the lab, to generate these graphs, a frog gastrocnemius muscle, basically its calf muscle, was isolated and used to study muscle contraction. It was um, attached to an electrode and attached to a device that recorded how much tension was produced and recorded it such that it produces a graph of that tension or what's called a myogram. Do understand that what I'm going to show you is not normal contraction. It was done under controlled conditions in a lab. Okay, and so here's the first of several graphs I'm going to show you. We have on the x-axis here time, right? So this is zero and this is time, seconds. Tension, or the amount of force generated by the muscle, is here on the y-axis. So when we take that frog gastrocnemius muscle and we deliver a brief electrical stimulus, a single brief electrical stimulus, we get rise in tension followed by a fall in tension. That is called a twitch. Now, this is not the type of twitch that occurs when one of your muscles twitches. This is much more brief than that, right? You wouldn't even feel this. This is in a laboratory condition, okay? This is not what actually occurs in the human body normally, okay? Stimulation, increase in tension, followed by a drop in tension. Well, why is this happening? Well, that electrical stimulus causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. As calcium levels rise, tension rises. Then that calcium doesn't stay in the cytoplasm. It, it moves back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. As it moves back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, fewer and fewer myosin heads are binding to the actin filament, and we get this drop in tension. Okay. Now, what is interesting is, look at what happens if we deliver several electrical stimuli in succession. So we, if we had just one stimulation, rise and then fall. What if we have several? We have a stimulation, and it rises and begins to fall, and then we hit it again. Then it rises, but this time it rises at a level greater than the previous one, and then begins to fall, hit it again, and then it rises even more. So you have this actually summing of contractions. You have each successive contraction sort of building on upon the previous one. Well, what's actually happening here? Well, what you're seeing is the effect of greater and greater concentrations of calcium in the cytoplasm. So you have a rise in tension as calcium is released, and the calcium starts to go back in. Then another stimulation releases even more calcium to a level greater than the previous one. So more myosin heads are binding the actin filaments, and then they start to move back in. Then another stimulation, boom, even higher. Right? So the point here is that those motor neurons are generating multiple action potentials releasing in succession acetylcholine and that those multiple risks causes greater and greater tension being produced by the way this summing of contractions is called tetanus This is unfused tetanus where you actually have uh, some relaxation between stimulations. But we can actually increase those stimulations to such a frequency that there is no relaxation at all. So in other words, we have this sustained maximum amount of calcium in the cytoplasm. So we have the maximum number of myosin heads binding to the actin filaments. Okay, so those motor neurons, when you contract the muscle, those motor neurons are firing at a high frequency to sustain that muscle contraction. Okay, but fused or complete tetanus, as we see here, where there's no relaxation, is not actually what's responsible for the smooth, sustained contractions of muscles that we see. That's actually due to different 
motor units contracting at different times. Okay. So I got a little ahead of my slides here, but the calcium in the cytoplasm remains elevated between successive contractions, and that maximizes the number of cross bridges between the myosin heads and the active filaments, and so we get this sustained muscle contraction. As I said, motor units active at any given time um, are what are responsible for sustained muscle contraction, okay? The more, as I said earlier, the more skeletal muscle fibers that are contracting at any given time, the more, uh, the greater the force. So, what that means is the more motor units, one, two, and three, or I guess I should say uh, um, A, B, and C, the more motor units that are active at any time, the greater the force generated by a muscle. So when I go to lift the maximum amount of weight that I can with my arm, with my right arm, you better believe that I have all my motor units that, that um, control that movement are active versus if I just like raise my hand, probably very few motor units are active because I'm just counteracting gravity. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about muscle tone. I want you to understand that as long as you are living, there are you have a certain amount of muscle tone. Your muscles are never completely flaccid unless there's a severing of the muscle fi uh, nerve fibers that control your muscles. Even when you are sleeping, there's a certain amount of muscle tone. There's a certain amount of motor units that are active. Now, different fibers contract at different times to provide this muscle tone. So you don't necessarily feel this muscle tone because it, it may be very, a, a small number of muscle fibers are contracting at any given time, but there's always a certain amount of muscle tone as long as you're alive. The, <clears throat> this is involuntary control. So in other words, you're not even aware that it, that it's, that it exists. Now, as I said earlier, the, the amount of force produced by a muscle really depends on the number of fibers that are stimulated. The greater the number of fibers that are contracting at any given time, the greater the muscle tension. But understand that there is always a certain there's always some stimulation of some muscle fibers. This is important for thermal regulation. Remember that your skeletal muscles are responsible for producing most of your body heat. So again, even when you are sleeping, there are, there are motor neurons that are activating some small amounts of motor neurons. Also, when you, to maintain posture, just to sit up, just to hold your head up, even though you may not feel it or think about it, the uh, muscles in the back of your, of your neck are contracting. When you are standing, the muscles in uh, your abdominal region and your lumbar region are contracting. So again, there's always a certain amount of uh, muscle tone, so there's a certain amount of motor neuron, motor unit active at all times. Muscles can continue to contract unless they run out of energy. They are or become what's called fatigued. Okay? When there aren't many motor neurons active, then fatigue is less likely to occur. Let me give you an example. Okay, so I want you to think about the following. So all day you're walking around or standing, sitting, what have, what have you, and you're holding your head up all day long. Well, what allows you to hold your head up? Well, there are muscles in the back of your neck that are contracting and holding your head up all day long. Why don't they ever get tired? 
Do you ever go home at the end of a day and go, oh, I've been holding my head up all day. I, oh, I'm so, I'm so, those muscles were hurting. I, I, I would, I'm so glad I can relax now. No. Well, how is it that these muscles can contract all day and they never get tired? Well, um, your head is relatively light uh, compared to the uh, strength of these muscles. So, um, different motor units can be active while other motor units are basically inactive at any given time. So certain motor units are active, providing enough tension to hold up your head, and then they're able to relax, and other motor units in these muscles activate while the other motor units are relaxing. So it's like they sort of switch off. These can, certain motor units can be active at one given time, and then they relax and others can be active at one given time because you don't have to have all the motor units active to hold up your head. And so these muscles generally will never fatigue, okay? At least not in a, you know, a 16 hour or however long uh, span of time you're awake. Now, if you were to like put a put some kind of hat on with the weight out in front of it that increases the weight of your head, you'd feel it in these muscles, and you would and you would find out that um, they would fatigue because now more motor units would have to be active at any given time, and they wouldn't have time to switch off and relax. And so they would fatigue over time. And you would want probably by within a few hours to take off that, that hat and, per, and perhaps relax your head. Okay? Um, when you lift something or a weight that maybe it, it's like the maximum amount you can lift, right? Maybe like one or two times. That's a lot of times that's what weightlifters do, right? They'll, they want to bench press. They want to find something they can only bench press one or two or three times. Right? Why can they only do it one, two, or three times? Well, it's because it's so heavy that it requires all the motor units active in those muscles that allow for that movement. So there aren't any that are relaxing. They're all working at the same time. And eventually they all fatigue, right? And that's why you have to stop because you can only do it two or three times. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. Um, so this is where I stopped on. Wednesday. So what we'll do is we will I can share this again. We'll start here by looking at well where does the energy come from for muscle contraction? And then we'll move to the effect of uh different types. Well we'll talk about the different types of Contraction, isotonic versus isometric. And then finally, we'll talk about the effects of exercise on muscles. And then we'll start the endocrine system. Okay. So thank you for your time, and I'll see you online and in person on Friday.